Greetings, folks. Exoparadigm Gamer here. I wasn't planning on waiting until next year to get to this one, but the past nine months have been rough and this was the earliest I could get to it. In any case, last time we took an overdue look at Metroid on the NES and Metroid Zero Mission on the GBA. I say overdue because over five years ago, I reviewed Zero Mission's spiritual successor, a long-awaited fan remake of Metroid 2, cheekily titled Another Metroid 2 Remake. Now, usually I end up waiting a few years to review recent remakes, but in this case, I made an exception and pumped out an episode within a month. It's been over five years since my original review, and a lot has changed. AIM2R has received new updates by a new team of community developers following Nintendo's DMCA to the game's original creator, while Nintendo themselves released a remake of their own in 2017, Samus Returns for the 3DS. So, over the course of the next three videos, I want to address three questions. First, how well has the original Metroid 2 aged after over three decades. Second, how well does AM2R hold up five years and several updates later? Third, how does Samus Returns stack up with both the original and the fan remake? Without further ado, this is Metroid 2 Remake or Rebreak Revisited. Now, some viewers might ask why I'm bothering to revisit the original Metroid 2 when I already covered it pretty well in 2016. First of all, that review is several years old and is only in 1080p, whereas my current standard is 4K, and I'm too much of a perfectionist to leave one of the videos in the marathon in lower fidelity. Second, the game itself wasn't recorded on native hardware, as at the time I didn't have any of the equipment necessary to record non-HDMI consoles in high quality. Third, I like to think my writing and production has improved over time. The music is also pretty hit or miss. At least I hope so. And I want this Metroid marathon to represent my best work yet. Finally, my opinion on this game has changed somewhat over time. In the last episode, episode, I found myself appreciating the openness of the original NES game more than I had before. Now it's time to revisit the original Metroid 2 and see if it holds up better than I remember it. Metroid 2 falls directly from the crisis on Zebus in the first game. Knowing full well the destructive capabilities of the Metroid species, the Galactic Federation sends a research team to the planet where the original specimen was found, SR388. After losing contact with the expedition, the Federation sends a search and rescue team, followed by the Federation Police, all of which go missing in action. Desperate to rid the galaxy of the Metroid menace once and for all, the Federation again enlists space hunter Samus Aran, ordering her to wipe out every Metroid on the planet. While there, Samus discovers that the Metroids can undergo a four-stage metamorphosis, gaining eyes, teeth, and claws. Like the first game, Metroid 2's story provides a solid premise for an action-adventure game, but expounds on that potential with the strong use of environmental storytelling. SR388 itself is littered with the ruins of a lot Chozo civilization, reclaimed by nature and local wildlife. The origin and biology of the Metroid species is deliberately left to the player's interpretation, at least in this game. One of the biggest mysteries in this regard is why killing Metroids seems to consistently trigger earthquakes. While the reasoning could easily boil down to because game, my interpretation is that the Queen shares a symbiotic relationship with the planet itself, and the earthquakes represent her raging at the loss of her offspring. Speaking of which, one of my favorite moments in the game is when Samus comes across the first Omega Metroid. You're unwittingly boxed into a small ring and have to defeat the Omega to escape. This creates instant tension and forces you to rely on your current stockpile of missiles and energy tanks to survive. Of course, I couldn't discuss the story without mentioning the game's ending, which features perhaps the most important moment in the series' history. After exterminating every Metroid on the planet, and even killing the Queen, Samus witnesses the birth of a Metroid hatchling and decides to spare it. In doing so, the game is implying that Metroids can be more than the mindless killing machines you've seen throughout the game. Under the right circumstances, they're capable of love and compassion and who knows what else. Granted, you have to dig pretty deep into the subtext to find that meaning, since Samus herself doesn't really say anything about it in this game. Still, for a Game Boy title, that's some pretty compelling stuff. Similar to the previous review, we're playing Metroid 2 on the Game Boy Advance consolizer by Woozle, which offers the highest quality for the most authenticity. Unlike many first-party Game Boy games, there are no special palettes or borders for Metroid 2 on the Super Game Boy, so there was little point to recording it that way. While there are a ton of palettes on the GBC and GBA, I've chosen to present the game in simple black and white, similar to how it would appear on the Game Boy Pocket. Visually, Metroid 2 is a Game Boy game, meaning we're dealing with the monochromatic color scheme. Personally, I find Game 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 Game
Boy graphics have a cute retro charm to them, though some games do look better than others. Nevertheless, playing a game in monochrome can't help but feel dated by its very nature. Last time on Metroid, Samus Aran destroyed the evil by the brain and thwarted the space pirate's plans for galactic domination. Now she must brave the depths of the Metroid homeworld to eliminate their menace once and for all. Metroid 2 Return of Samus, only on Game Boy. The future is in your hands. At the same time, this was the hardware they had to work with, so I'm not going to judge the monochromaticity too harshly. Either way, I find that Metroid 2 makes some visual headway over the first game. Samus's sprite set has been completely redrawn with taller proportions, making her more credible as an intergalactic bounty hunter compared to the oversized child helmet from the first game. The animations also look marginally better, and surprisingly, there are unique animations for when Samus is facing left versus right. A vestigial detail to be sure, but it's more than I expect from a Game Boy title. Speaking of which, since there's no color, the Various Suit couldn't just swap the palette and call it a day. So the Various Suit actually has its own sprite set, marking the first appearance of Samus's iconic shoulder pads. The enemies have creative and charming designs, but my favorite being the saw blade cactus. Yes, I know it's supposed to be a bug, but come on, it looks like a cactus with saw blade arms. The designs for the Metroid evolutions are solid and do a good job communicating the gradual transformation from nuclear jellyfish to eldritch abomination. Unlike the varied ecosystem of Zebus, SR388 is composed entirely of rocky caverns and dilapidated temples, making for less overall environmental variance. Unfortunately, most of the backgrounds are still solid black, though every once in a while there's a bit of texture. I'm willing to tolerate this somewhat, given that they only had four shades to work with, and at least the sprites contrast against the background. At the same time, Super Mario Land had actual backgrounds, and that was a launch title, so I don't think it's expecting too much for Metroid 2 to have a little more background detail so the game doesn't feel like it's floating in a void. All in all, I'd still say later games like Link's Awakening and Super Mario Land 2 have this game beat in terms of visual fidelity and appeal, but other than the backgrounds, I don't think a Metroid title on Game Boy really could have looked much better than this. I should know note, seeing as someone is liable to bring it up, that there are several colorizer mods for Metroid 2 that, well, colorize the game. Many of you are familiar with Link's Awakening DX, a colorized re-release of the Game Boy Zelda game for the Game Boy Color. There are rumors that Nintendo was planning a similar effort for Metroid 2, but for one reason or another, it never surfaced. Consequently, the fan community took it upon themselves to develop their own colorizer mods. To keep this review in scope, I'll only be discussing what I consider the two major ones. Before I get to that, I should note there's a really old colorizer mod from 2007 called Metroid 2 Colorized, created by Z-Man and last updated in 2016. Unfortunately, this one doesn't seem to work. I tried the mod in three different emulators, none of which matched the screenshots. VBA and BGB roughly tie in quality, both sporting wildly inaccurate colors and tons of flickering. MGBA fared the best overall with more accurate Samus colors and less overall flickering. Since the mod doesn't specify any compatible emulators or include any instructions, I had to cut my losses and move on. Even then, the screenshots don't make it look very impressive. With results like that, I might as well just play with the default Game Boy Color palette. I will say this though, this hack has my favorite Samus palette out of any of the colorizer mods. With that out of the way, let's move on to the feature presentations. First up is Metroid 2 DX from 2013, created by Metroid Evolution, Dracon, and Spike Man based on an initial color insertion by Daniel Davis. I actually have a cart with this mod installed on it, so it's fully playable on the GBA consoleizer with proper matrix settings. As it happens, this mod got updated right when I was about to upload this review. I couldn't find any information on what was supposedly changed, so I did a second playthrough with BGB just to be safe. Overall, if there are any meaningful differences between this latest version and the cart version, I couldn't find them. A problem with this one is that you can see the game recoloring tiles from grayscale to color on the edge of the frame. What's worse, if you enter an area 
area with a different tile set, the frame will turn into garbage and then slowly recolor itself. The same thing happens if you play the game in BGB, so it's not the consoleizer's fault. The original game disguised this by fading to black during the transition, so I don't know why this version doesn't. A bigger problem that undermines the point of this hack is that the color choices aren't pleasant to look at. Samus looks acceptable, but the environments lack contrast and value or saturation, and some of the color palettes they chose for sprites honestly made me think my cartridge had a graphics glitch gremlin inside of it. Enemies aren't colored as they were depicted in future games, or even as they were in the manual. Case in point, Metroids are no longer green and red, but rather yellow and blue. That much is acceptable, but the bad color choices worsen the gameplay as well. Speaking as a designer in training, color language is a vital tool for communicating ideas to players at a glance. And with that in mind, this mod has some baffling oversights. For one, destructible soil patches are colored too dark to the point they blend into the background and don't stand out enough to make players want to shoot them. This passage here has overly darkened enough to resemble a solid platform rather than a hole the player is supposed to fall through. Most importantly, enemies do not change in palette when frozen with the ice beam, a bit of crucial feedback that even the NES game managed with the limitation of 16 simultaneous colors. The mod's biggest failing is that if you enter certain spaces, the game will crash and kick you back to the title screen without warning, a glitch that I reliably triggered multiple times in two spots. Based on my recent playthrough, I can confirm that both crash bots are active in BGB as well. Either way, considering this mod is supposed to work on actual hardware, this glitch is a huge problem. Bottom line, I would steer clear of Metroid 2 DX. It performs poorly and doesn't even look that good. The newer EJRTQ hack, created by EJRTain with Quantum, offers a much better experience. This hack is much more recent. It launched in 2019 and was updated in 2020. The color choices look overall better, and the game will fade to black during tile set transitions. Metroids are appropriately colored, and frozen enemies are thankfully recolored blue. Despite that, this mod still has an undersaturated grayish look to it that's unpleasant to the eyes. Most likely a limitation of the colorizer technology, but I still can't say this looks as good as an actual Game Boy Color game. A common problem between both of these colorizer mods is that it makes these solid black backgrounds stand out more than ever. Now, I won't criticize the mods themselves for that, since fixing the backgrounds would require inserting new tiles into the ROM and redrawing the backgrounds from scratch, something that was probably way out of the intended scope. I'm just saying that I personally prefer to play the game in monochrome, since the bland backgrounds aren't as striking that way. Regardless, if the lack of color in the original release was a turnoff for you, then the EJRTQ mod might be worth checking out. Moving on to the soundtrack, it's unfortunately a bit of a mixed bag. Metroid 2 was composed by Ryoji Yoshitomi, who many of you may know for composing Wario Land 4. Yoshitomi's compositions for Metroid 2 come in three flavors, the first of which being melodious. The main theme I actually quite like. It's catchy, adventurous, and isn't held back by the hardware whatsoever. The Ruins theme is repetitive, but it has kind of a mysterious undertone that fits really well. The next flavor is Discordant 8-Bit Chaos. I think Yoshitomi intended for this to be horrifying and intense, but to me, it just sounds like a glitchy Casio farting out random pulse waves. And then there's this gem. <laughs> Again, Yoshitomi probably intended for this to be scary or mysterious, but to me, it just sounds like noise. The final flavor is low-key ambient textures. 
For what it's worth, Metroid 2 does have a surprising amount of atmosphere, as much as a Game Boy game could have anyway, and the sound design is a big reason why. I can give these tracks credit for not being annoying, like the Metroid boss theme, but as far as atmosphere-focused tracks go, the series can do a lot better, and it's not just because it's 8-bit. The first Metroid skillfully blended melody and atmosphere, so in that regard, I think the problem with 2 is just the composition. Yoshitomi is good at doing melody or atmosphere individually, but can't seem to bridge the two together in a way that brings out the best of both approaches. This is doubly confusing given that Wario Land 4 presents a perfect blend of atmosphere and melody. Don't get me wrong, I think there's something to the music in Metroid 2, it's just not really for me. Moving on to gameplay, the goal of Metroid 2 is to destroy every Metroid on SR388. Periodically, you'll find your way forward blocked by a pool of lava. To progress, Samus needs to defeat all the Metroids in the immediate area, which will trigger an earthquake and lower the lava. The game is nice enough to include a global counter to track the entire Metroid population, but as commenters on my older video pointed out, pausing the game will display how many Metroids are left in the current area. While that's useful, I can't help but feel the placement of the global global and local counters should have been the other way around, since the latter is astronomically more useful during gameplay. Beyond the addition of Metroid mini-bosses, the core game loop is identical to the first game. You jump and shoot your way through an interconnected game world while unlocking upgrades that allow you to access new places. Metroid 2 brings back every ability from the original game, though this time you start off with the long beam, the morph ball, and 30 missiles. Control-wise, Metroid 2 introduces several refinements over the first game. You'll recall that Metroid had no reliable ways of dealing with groundbound enemies. Bombs were too slow in plotting, and the game actively discourages you from acquiring the wave beam since it means backtracking for an ice beam later. Metroid 2 fixes this by allowing Samus to duck and shoot shorter enemies as well as shoot directly downwards while jumping. While starting the series with Super Metroid undoubtedly affected my expectations when playing the first Metroid, I wouldn't have minded the absence of these abilities if the game didn't have enemies that were too short to shoot while standing. If this enemy type was going to stick around, then duck shooting and fall shooting were important and necessary improvements to the basic controls, and adding them in Metroid 2 enhances the moment-to-moment -moment game feel tenfold. Metroid 2 continues overhauling the combat with a better, expanded weapon selection. The Ice Beam and Wave Beam are functionally identical to the first game, though this time you can damage enemies while frozen, which makes the Ice Beam infinitely more useful. There are also two new beams to play with. The Spacer Beam, which triples the height of your shot shots, and the Plasma Beam, a smaller shot that kills enemies faster. Like Metroid 1, you can only equip one of these weapons at a time, since there still isn't a Mega Man-style weapon switching screen. Unlike the first game, however, there are multiple instances of each beam power-up, so it's much easier to switch back. There's even an Ice Beam right next to the entrance to the final dungeon, which gets a thumbs up from me. Thanks to the added convenience, the intent of the playstyle-oriented beam system from the first game is much better realized here. While I still prefer for the stacking system from later games, these beam power-ups are fun to use and feel good to unlock. Like the first game, uncovering new power-ups through exploring feels satisfying, and given how that's the core appeal of the genre, that's an important aspect to get right. Unfortunately, I can't say as much for the platforming. Most of it amounts to hopping around basic ledges, and like the first game, I found myself having to jam my thumb all the way down in the A button to get any decent height. Samus may be on an alien planet with weird gravity, but real Realism doesn't necessarily make for satisfying controls. Personally, I prefer something a little more responsive. In addition, Samus also feels like she's moving at two-thirds the speed she probably should. There are parts of Area 6 where you have to painstakingly space jump around thorns, and it feels like Samus is moving through molasses for all the momentum she has. This was probably done to limit the effects of screen crunch, seeing as Samus herself takes up so much of the frame. If that was the intention, then I say they succeeded. I very I rarely found myself getting blindsided by enemies or hazards from off-screen. The only time I found the camera failed to keep up is if you allow yourself to drop straight down vertical shafts, but I'm willing to accept that as me being impatient. So yeah, given the choice between screen crunch and slow movement, I think Nintendo made the right call. Nevertheless, the chuggy movement of this and other Game Boy platformers drags down the overall game feel and ages poorly compared to their 16-bit contemporaries. While the overall platforming loop is identical, 
identical to the first game, Metroid 2 does offer three innovations to add some variance. First is the Spider Ball, which would later become a staple of the Metroid Prime trilogy. Basically, you cling to walls and can use it to traverse the ceiling. For what it is, it handles well and makes for more interesting morph ball gameplay than the uneventful straight tunnels in the first game. The second innovation is the Spring Ball. Morph ball bombs return, but they explode slower than my upload rate. This was probably done to prevent infinite bomb jumping, but this also makes general morph ball navigation a pain in the early game. The spring ball fixes this by letting you jump in morph ball form and makes bomb jumping a non-issue, and also pairs well with the spider ball. Finally, this game introduces the space jump, which allows Samus to repeatedly somersault through the air. It's a decent power trip after all the slower paced climbing in the early game and mixes up the platforming for the late game. What hurts it for me is that the timing for the inputs is very finicky. If you miss the timing even slightly, Samus will drop like a rock with no chance at a recovery. This can be really annoying in areas like the tower in Area 6, since it takes forever to climb up, but one slightly missed button input can send you plummeting all the way back down. Moving on to other gameplay innovations, Metroid 2 improves over both the Japanese and North American versions of Metroid 1 by introducing save stations. Simply stand on one and press start, and you'll respawn at that location if you die or reload your save. Quick, simple, and much more convenient than the cumbersome 24 character passwords from the first game. You'll recall that my biggest criticism of the original Metroid was the lack of a fast, reliable way to recover your health and missiles. That, combined with the abysmal drop rate of pickups, meant that refilling your health was an unnecessary time sink even by 1986 standards. While the drop rate for health is still poor, and 20 unit pickups still aren't as common as I'd like, Metroid 2 introduces recharge stations that will fully restore your health and ammo. They could stand to be a little more common than they are, and the Omega Nest in Area 9 is a good example of this. Here, you fight three Omega Metroids, who soak up damage like a Ratchet and Clank boss and can whittle your health down to nothing very quickly. If you run out of missiles, you either need to grind these motos or backtrack all the way to the nearest recharge station in Area 6. Again, I will gladly accept some mild backtracking over the mandatory grinding from the first game game, but I'm just saying. Was there any good reason not to have recharge stations in the nest? Speaking of Omegas, the bosses in Metroid 2 are a marginal improvement over Ridley and Kraid from the first game. While those guys just stood around and let you shoot them, the Metroids are more aggressive and actively target you. Gammas can shoot electricity, Zetas shoot fireballs, and Omegas shoot exploding fireballs. Despite their zealous behavior, each Metroid mutation is fundamentally just a missile sponge that tries to ram you. I find the Zetas and Omegas especially annoying, since unlike earlier mutations, they're completely invulnerable from the bottom. Consequently, you'll find yourself repeatedly hopping and firing missiles in the hopes of stun-locking them long enough to finish them off. For whatever reason, however, your rate of missile fire is much lower in the air than on the ground, so if you're lucky, you might be able to hit a Zeta or Omega twice with each jump cycle. Frankly, this just feels boring and sluggish, and I might as well be playing a rhythm game for all the substance it has. I did learn from Wikitroid that Omegas take extra damage if you hit them in the back. Upon playing around with it in later playthroughs, I discovered that there is a slightly different animation and sound effect from hitting an Omega in the front versus the back, but the difference is so subtle that I almost didn't notice. Bottom line, the Metroid mini-bosses aren't that challenging or engaging to begin with, and given that you fight 39 of them in total, the limited variation starts to wear on you pretty quickly. There's also a mini-boss against a Arachnus, which appears in later games, but his AI is pretty smooth-brained and he dies in about five hits. Even the Metroid Queen herself is just another repetitive missile sponge without the distractors that made Mother Brain interesting. If you didn't know any better, the best strategy is to wait for her to open her mouth, spam missiles, and hope that she dies before you do. The pro strat is actually to morph ball into the Queen's mouth while she's stunned and lay bombs in her stomach, which kills her in about five hits. However, I'm not sure sure how anyone is supposed to figure that out without a guide. At the very least, the bomb strat adds a little more finesse to an otherwise repetitive fight. 
With all that out of the way, let's talk about level design, perhaps the most important feature of any Metroidvania. The problem with Planet Zebus in Metroid 1 is how slapdash and awkward the spatial design was. The visuals and room layouts were copy-pasted over and over, which made navigation confusing and took away from the thrill of discovery since everything looks the same. Given the shift to the Game Boy, you'd think SR388 would be smaller than Zebus, but it's actually much larger. Overall, the room layouts are more varied compared to Zebus, which makes mentally mapping the game world more realistic for a first-time player. Despite each temple using a similar tile set, each one has a unique design to distinguish itself. While I was prepared to praise Metroid 2 for reducing the copy-pasted room layouts over Metroid 1, I realized while scrubbing through footage for clips that there's a lot more of it than I initially suspected. Almost every Chozo statue room has a little tunnel under it, regardless of whether it actually goes anywhere. Meanwhile, vertical shafts tend to repeat the same screen over and over. At the same time, there are also some really interesting and memorable room layouts that surpass anything from the first game, namely the cavernous domes surrounding each temple. As I alluded to earlier, there are actually some decent morph ball tunnels and other platforming sections, and even some honest-to-god puzzles or mechanical challenges you have to solve to uncover missile expansions. So by all accounts, SR388 is simply more fun to explore than Zebus was. Personally speaking, I also find the environments are much more immersive. Whereas Zebus felt like a matrix of blocks haphazardly arranged to vaguely resemble a location, the temples and caverns of SR388 actually feel like the remains of a lost civilization. Given the hardware they were working with, that deserves major kudos. While the level design is better than the first games by virtue of not being a rushed mess, it does have its drawbacks. The overall structure of SR388 is basically a giant circle. A donut, if you will. It's not a donut, it's an Ouroboros! Oh, right, because everybody knows what that is. Hanging off the main tunnels are five temple areas and five Metroid nests. So you quickly fall into a loop of finding a new temple, exploring for new upgrades to access new areas and increase your combat capabilities, and defeating all the Metroids in the area. It's an effective core game loop, but the level design and even the backtracking feels fairly compartmentalized as a result. The good news is that you can find every pickup in an area on your first visit, which means for once I don't have to complain about in-game cleanup. Not that it matters, because Metroid 2 once again does not track your completion percentage. Now within temples, you do have some freedom to choose what order to collect upgrades, uncover expansions, and defeat all the Metroids. While that's great and all, the game structure can't help but feel repetitive for the visuals if nothing else, and it unquestionably lacks the openness and freedom of the first game. The most backtracking comes after Area 3, which involves crisscrossing between Area 4 and 5 before you can finally move on to the 4th temple in Area 6. Not to mention, the level design of the main tunnels connecting the temples and nests just amounts to static corridors with some basic enemies and platforming. There are no expansions to find or puzzles to solve, so all you're doing is walking, walking, occasionally jumping, and more walking. Despite all the improvements to the level design over Metroid 1, I still can't help but find the navigation confusing at times. All things considered, the worst part of the game is probably this morph ball tunnel in Area 6. The entire frame is pitch black, so you need to drop bombs constantly just to orient yourself in space. I get that this room was supposed to be disorienting, and I can see that working well on hardware with better luma and chroma contrast. On Game Boy, however, it's just not fun to play at all. Another low light is the Metroid nest underneath Area 3. Every room looks the same, and the worst copy-pasting happens here. If you're anything like me, you spent a lot of time wandering back and forth across Area 3 trying to find that last Metroid you missed. A map would have solved this problem in an instant, but for some reason, Metroid 2 still doesn't have one. I'll be fair and acknowledge that even though Link's Awakening had a map feature, that game wouldn't come out for another year and seven months, by which point cartridges were probably bigger and maybe featured better chipsets. Still, in my heart of hearts, I feel like it was perfectly reasonable to expect this game to have a map. If that wasn't technically feasible, then the layout of this nest needed to be more unique to better facilitate player guidance. A simple radar that gets louder or faster the closer you get to a Metroid would have worked as well. 
In conclusion, while I may have sounded negative during this review, I actually like Metroid 2 just fine for what it is. Overall, I consider Metroid 2 a substantial improvement over the first for the better controls, better level design, more convenient beam swapping, a much appreciated save feature, and the addition of recharge stations. This game lacks the frustrating learning curve of its predecessor, making it more approachable for a first time player, and is just more fun to play on a moment to moment level. Unfortunately, Metroid 2 still falls victim to sluggish jumping and movement controls, repetitive bosses, occasionally confusing level design, and the perplexing omission of a map or even a simple radar. If I'm being honest, I also find that while the temple areas are fun, a lot of the connective tissue in between is just kind of white noise gameplay. Additionally, after gaining a better appreciation for the first game, it's also disappointing that Metroid 2 lacks the freedom and openness of its predecessor. I replayed the first game four times for that review and found a different way to route it each time. While I replayed Metroid 2 a similar number of times for various reasons, I find that there's only really one good way to play it. So while I think Metroid 2 is a better game based on its overall design, I'd still argue Metroid is more replayable in the long term. Despite all that, I can't really bring myself to dislike Metroid 2. It's not the most entertaining game I've ever played, but it also doesn't have any major game-breaking flaws like the first one. Either way, there were a handful of interesting ideas, so I can see why the prospect of a remake was so attractive to both the fans and Nintendo themselves. So that's the original game covered. Join me next time and we'll take a second look at one of the most famous fan games of all time, AM2R Return of Samus for the PC. Until next time, I'm Exo Paradigm Gamer, and I hope you all enjoyed the review.